Hello, and welcome to Fairview Baptist Church. I'm Pastor John Boyacek. I'm so glad you could join us in worship today. I trust that you will be blessed. I come from a family of pastors and missionaries that go back generations and generations. Uh, my dad's father was born on the mission field in the Congo um, in Africa, and my dad's mother was born in Guatemala. My dad himself was born in Honduras. And so because of that, whenever people say, like, what's your heritage? I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I, who knows? But as a missionary kid, my dad spent mo most of his school years in boarding school in Central America uh, and in the States. And I remember my dad telling me years ago about one of his, his favorite uh, boarding school memories. It was the end of grade eight. And they had this graduation uh, trip that they would do every year. But the teachers, in order to build anticipation towards this trip, they put a bit of a spin on it. They called it the sneak. And what it was, was there was a period of maybe two or three days when the kids knew it could be time at any moment to leave, to go on their trip. So they had these, these, these three days where they didn't know when it was that they were going to leave, all they knew is they had to be ready, and it could happen at any moment. It could have been during a meal. It could have been during a class. It could have been during recess. All they knew is they needed to await that moment when the teacher would say, it's the sneak. And then it was the fun part. They would all tiptoe off campus to the the pre-arranged rendezvous meeting point, doing their best to be unnoticed by the other classes on campus and the other teachers on campus. And for grade eight boys, anticipation is a powerful motivator, right? You want to get someone excited, put some mystery into it. They were ready. They were ready for that moment that could arrive really at any time. They didn't know the day, they didn't know the hour, but boy, were they ready. In Matthew chapter 24, open there with me this morning, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus' disciples asked him, Jesus, when will be the sign, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Is there anything that's going to happen that will kind of give us uh, a hint that your arrival is nearing? As you read through chapter 24, Jesus told his disciples that before his kingdom would come uh, to earth and be established here, false messiahs would arise. They would lead many people astray by doing things that were miraculous doing things like miracles, doing things like wonders, doing things like signs. Jesus said that his followers would face persecution in these end days. People would walk away from the faith. Sounds pretty bleak, doesn't it? In fact, it sounds like today in lots of ways. But Jesus gave them this promise of hope. He said... To the one who stands firm to the end, he will be saved. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And in this moment, I can imagine Peter, right? He was the loud one. I can imagine him just, just asking, but Jesus, when? When will you come back to establish your kingdom? Is it a year from now? Is it 10 years? When? How much longer do we have to wait for your kingdom to come about? And in verse 36, look what Jesus says. About the day or the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven. 
nor the Son, but only the Father. And then in verse 42, he says, therefore, keep watch, because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. Keep watch, anticipate, look forward to, and be ready. And here we are, 2,000 years later, God's people still waiting for him to return. How often do you think of Christ's return? We proclaim as a church that Jesus is coming back. We proclaim and we agree together that he could come back at any moment. But when you wake up in the morning, is your first thought, could today be the day? Lord, is today the day when you'll come back, when you'll come back and bring us to be with you for all eternity? More than that, I I question sometimes, do we actually believe Jesus' words that he could, in fact, return today? I mean, after all, if you, if you scrolled on a, a world news app right now, don't do it right now, but if you did, you'd see a lot of the signs that Jesus said would precede his coming. Satan has empowered many to do signs and wonders that have led nations and peoples astray. We see whole denominations at a time walking away from the faith and the gospel. Believers are being persecuted and and killed all around the world. Many who have claimed to be faithful followers of Jesus, where, where are they anymore? They've faded out. And though we see these signs and wonders that Jesus spoke of, and though we believe cognitively that Jesus will come back, there seems to be part of us that doesn't really believe it could be today. And because of this unspoken attitude, we've become complacent in different ways. In keeping watch for that day, we've become lax in our anticipation of Jesus' second coming. And dare I say it, we've, we've even stopped looking forward to his return. We think, well, he hasn't come in 2,000 years, so he probably won't come today or even in my lifetime. This sort of outlook or or view on the second coming, it's massively impacted our our day and our day-to-day living in ways we don't even begin to understand. Because we think we have all this time before Christ's return, we aren't so compelled to share the gospel with the lost. We don't feel that urgency We become lax in our being on mission for the Lord, and instead we we pour our time and our energy into things that really have absolutely no eternal worth or impact. And in doing all this, we put off being prepared for Christ's return. We put off being prepared for Christ's return. But Jesus was clear with his disciples, okay? No one but the Father knows the day or the hour, and because of this, we must anticipate his coming eagerly. Await it. Be prepared. Be be ready, because today could be that day. In other words, live today in light of that day while realizing that today could be the day. Live today in light of that day while realizing that today could be the day. So how can you and I be ready for Jesus to come back? That's the question we want to tackle this morning together. That's the question that Jesus in the first part of Matthew 25 addresses. If you want to turn there with me, please. Matthew 25 will be in verses 1 to 13. 
How can we be prepared for Jesus to come back? How can we know that we are prepared? Whenever my family has gone on vacation, it's always a reminder to me that each of us think of being prepared in different ways, right? For some in my family, being prepared means having every meal planned. It means uh, having most of the bathroom cupboard packed. This isn't my brother's, by the way. Um, and enough clothes and books to last for about a month. But for some of us, preparedness means having just enough clothes to get by and maybe, maybe your toothbrush and deodorant. Now, if you're coming with me to Quebec, you're already locked in. You can't, you know, bow out now. But um, this kind of readiness, in other words, I think we each, when we just hear that word preparedness or ready, we can think of different degrees. It's subjective, okay? But the kind of readiness that Jesus is talking about is not subjective. It's completely objective. When he returns, we will either be ready or we won't. For Jesus, there, there is no in-between. So again, how can we be ready? How can we be prepared for his coming? Well, that's exactly what Jesus is saying in Matthew uh, chapter 25. He decides he's going to tell them a story. He's going to tell his disciples this short story to tell them how they can be prepared, how they can be ready. And so in verse 1, Jesus says, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but didn't take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Let's just pause right there for a moment. In this culture and time, couples who got married would have a celebration uh, with their closest friends at the groom's house the day of the wedding. And so in this parable, these 10 young friends uh, gather at the home of the groom and they're waiting for the married couple to arrive. Now, it's, it's actually not um, particularly significant that Jesus describes them as being virgins. All that he means is they're young, okay? Young friends of the married couple. And so they're, as they're waiting, they have these lamps, okay? And although these lamps uh, would have been primarily for practical use, right? To sleep, to, to, to see in the dark, to see when they, when they wake up from their sleep. Uh, lighting lamps in this culture probably also was an indication of uh, preparing for the arrival of an important person. Okay, if someone important is going to arrive, you light up the room. You get ready by, by preparing in that way. And so these friends got ready by having their lamps lit. Now, as the parable goes, five of the young virgins were wise and five were foolish. The wise friends brought extra oil to fuel their lamps because they knew that though the arrival of the married couple was imminent, okay, it could happen at any moment, they also knew they needed to be prepared to wait just in case there was some sort of delay. The five foolish friends, on the other hand, they didn't have this mindset at all. And rather, they only brought enough oil for a short while. Well, it says that the bridegroom took a long time in coming, and eventually the ten friends, they, they'd fall asleep, right? And so in verse 6, it says, At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. I don't know about you, but if I was at a wedding where they didn't arrive till midnight, I, 
I wouldn't even be there sleeping. I'd be at home sleeping, right? Um, but I guess this is a different culture. So the moment had arrived, and this cry is going up, get the party started. That's what they're saying. Goes on, then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. But now here comes the moment of tension. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Have you ever been in a, a, a school or maybe work situation where you were working with somebody and you had this meeting and you showed up to the meeting and the person you were meeting with was totally unprepared? That's frustrating, right? Or what about if you were a, a soccer or, a, or a, a volleyball coach or maybe a basketball coach and you're, you're calling all your players together to have uh, a practice and all of them show up in jeans and flip-flops? That too is annoying, right? You would be frustrated. And so I can only imagine the frustration that these wise friends would have felt in this situation. They're probably thinking, you knew that there could have been delay in his coming. You knew that it would take time for the groom to arrive. Why didn't you prepare? Why didn't you bring extra oil just in case? And so in verse 9, they answer, no. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, Jesus says, keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. Jesus says, I'm coming back to establish my kingdom and I could come at any moment, at any time, be ready, anticipate my return, look for it, long for it. But more than anything, be ready for it. Live today in light of that day while realizing that today could be the day. What does Jesus mean when he told his disciples and as he tells us this morning to be ready? to watch for his coming? How do we keep watch? How do we uh, live today in light of that day while realizing that today could be that day? Well, Jesus' story gives us a lot to consider uh, with that question. First, we see that those who are watchful and ready for Christ's return, they know Jesus and they honor him for who he truly is. Those who are ready for Christ's return know Jesus and they honor him for who he truly is. They, they show him this honor by preparing properly, by being ready, by taking his arrival seriously. Uh, in the parable, the foolish virgins, uh, they didn't see the weight of this momentous occasion, right, of his arrival. And so in response, they chose not to bring enough oil just in case they had to wait, right? And in a similar way, many in our world uh, either don't believe in the message of Scripture at all, or they do believe in Jesus, and they might even say he's coming back, but they haven't repented of sin. Instead, they just push him away in an effort to do what they want now, right? Right? In either case, those who push Jesus away in, in either unbelief or in blatant rebellion, they refuse to know him and they refuse to honor him 
as he truly is. But here's the reality. Jesus is who he says he is, right? We're not at liberty to define Jesus. He is the creator and king. He is the savior of the world. He is the true way. He is the living way. And scripture says that he's the only righteous judge. And when he comes back, he will be the king and savior and lover of all who have repented and come to saving faith in him. But for those who have rejected him, he will be their terrible and righteous judge. The wise virgins saw the coming of the groom as important. They held the groom in high regard. And because of their high regard for him, they were ready. They were ready. And they were even ready to wait for his arrival in case there was delay. Those who are watchful and ready for Christ's return know Jesus. And they respond to him with giving him the honor he deserves. They believe that he is the righteous judge. And they believe that he is the savior of the world. And more than that, they've repented. And they call him their savior. They've been reconciled to God. And so this morning, I have to say this. If you haven't repented of your sin, Jesus says this morning that you're not ready. You're not ready for him to come back yet. If he was to return right now, you wouldn't be ready. Or even on the other hand, if you were to to die today, you wouldn't be ready for that judgment. Someone once said that God has given us each the sacred choice of whether to love him or not in this world. That's true. He's given us that sacred choice. But he hasn't left it up to our own determination to decide what happens on the other side of eternity based on whether we choose to love him or not. We can choose to love him, but we can't choose what the consequences of our either choosing him or rejecting him are for eternity. Only Jesus can decide that, right? So are you ready? Do you know Jesus? Have you repented of sin and and called Jesus to save you? If you haven't, just call on him right now in the quietness of your own heart. Call on him and ask him to save you. He will. You have his word on it. Do you know him? The next thing that we see uh, in this parable is that those who were ready and watchful for the groom's arrival were known by him. Did you notice that? They were known by him. They didn't just know him, but he knew them too. In the end of the story, we see those who were not ready for the coming of the groom. They're standing at the doorstep, right? They're pounding on the door. It's like they can hear the music inside going, "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm," you know? They can hear it, and they want in. So they say, let me in. And the groom has a rough response. He comes to them, he says, I don't know you. And so they're barred entry. They'd rejected him by not preparing. They'd rejected him by not preparing. In Matthew 7, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my father in heaven. In the language of this parable, those who will inherit the kingdom of heaven are the ones who are ready. He goes on and he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, 
Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Those who are ready, those who are watchful for the return of Christ are known by him. He knows them. And this isn't a a, a cognitive knowledge. It's not just a cognitive or or, um, a, a mental assent to knowing that Jesus is talking about. He knows everything about us, right? He knows your name. Scripture says that. He knows uh, the, the, the number of hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. But what he's talking about is, I never knew you intimately. I was never close with you. I was never your friend. You never allowed me to be Lord of your life. The scary thing to me about this parable and this passage is that those who were not ready for Christ's return, those who weren't ready to face the final judgment of Jesus, were not necessarily distinguishable between those who were. It wasn't until the groom arrived and the virgins went to trim their candle wicks that it became apparent which of them were wise and which were foolish. It was the arrival of the groom that revealed who was actually ready and who was not. And in the same way, Jesus says that at his second coming, at his second coming, there are going to be people at the judgment who looked and played the part of people who were ready and watchful for his return. They prophesied in his name. They cast out demons in his name. They attended church every Sunday of their lives. They they served on every committee that they possibly could. They volunteered in the shelters, feeding orphans and widows. They taught Sunday school classes for years. They might have even preached sermons or evangelized on street corners. But in their hearts... They never repented. In their hearts, they were reliant on their own merit to to get them into heaven. They might have cognitively understood the gospel. They might have cognitively understood their need for Jesus' salvation, but they never repented and they never received that free gift. It was their choice. And so Jesus says to them at the final judgment, I never knew you. You know what's so hard for me about this passage? Is that Jesus is telling the truth. And in telling the truth, he's saying that there could be people here this morning who appear to be ready, who appear to have it all together because of how they live their outward lives. But like the foolish virgins, indistinguishable from the wise virgins, I fear this morning that there are some here today who that because of how you serve in different ministries or because of how you talk or because of how you give to the church, you have a false sense of security that your name is written in the book of life. But Jesus says to those people at the end of the age, I never knew you. Not ever. It's only the blood of Jesus that saves and grants us access to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Only the blood of Jesus. And so please, hear Jesus' words this morning. 
hear them. That it's possible to play the part and in the end be barred entry. Because those who are ready know Jesus and honor him for truly, who he truly is. And because those who are ready are also known by Jesus. So do you know him? And does he know you? Do you know him? And does he know you? Or are you just playing the part? Those who are ready for Jesus' return are the ones who have cast themselves upon the mercies of God. We've come to him and said, I have nothing. And I never will. You have to save me. Then Jesus says, I know you. I know you, and I love you, and you're mine. So are you known by him? Now, you might be feeling anxious at this point. Wondering now, <laughs> am, I, am I even saved? I have two responses to that. It could be this morning that you're feeling anxious is actually a sign that you are saved. It could be. The fact that you care so much about being right with God and that you, you desire to live your life for him, you desire to love him, you desire to be changed by him, all of those are fantastic signs of salvation. They're fantastic. If you're walking with Jesus and you're seeing his Holy Spirit at work in your heart, changing you little by little each day, you don't have to fear. You don't have to fear. The Holy Spirit is your assurance that you're saved. But if you feel anxious right now because you've never trusted Jesus as your sin taker, then it's a good thing that you feel anxious because you're not ready yet. You're not. And you need to do some business with God and you can do that right now. You can do it right now. Cry out to him. Cast yourself on his mercy, knowing that only he can save you. Only he can save you and qualify you for heaven. To everyone, though, this morning, Jesus is saying, do not assume that you're saved because of your outward religiosity. Don't assume that you're saved because of your outward religiosity. Religiosity cannot save you. Only Jesus can. And so are you trusting him? But the final thing that we see in this parable, this is beautiful, is that those who are ready for Christ's coming don't need to live in fear while waiting for his coming. They don't need to live in fear while waiting for his coming. Those who have saving faith don't need to constantly worry about what might happen in the days leading up to Christ's return. In fact, those who are truly prepared can rest with hearts filled with peace. Did you notice in the text that in verse 5, it says the bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now, Jesus doesn't get upset with the wise ones for sleeping. Hmm. Why? The falling asleep during the wait was not the thing that condemned the foolish virgins. Okay? You need to see that. Falling asleep wasn't the issue. It was the fact that they had ample opportunity to prepare and rather rested in their false sense of security that they were prepared. That's the issue, okay? They thought that they would have ample time to get ready, but in the, time, in, in the end, they didn't. The wise virgins, on the other hand, they knew that they were ready. They had prepared. And so, they rested. They rested. 
If you've been saved by Jesus and given new life in him, your heart can rest as you wait for his return. I love that. We don't need to live frantic lives constantly uh, fearing the future. We don't need to, to worry what the future might hold because our future is eternally secure. Our Savior's coming and he's going to bring us with himself to his wedding banquet. There are lots of Christians who live in constant fear. You probably know some of them. Maybe you're one of them. When, when they hear the rise of crime or, or, or persecution in the world, uh, they respond with crippling fear. Or when we hear of immoral advances in technology or uh, so-called health care, we get our backs up and we become fearful rather than resting that Jesus is sovereign. Or when they hear of bills being passed in Parliament that go against everything that is holy and righteous, there's this paralyzing anxiety that can grip us. We can cave into this feeling of despair, even, even hopelessness. But that's not God's will for us. I want you to hear that this morning. That is not God's will for us, church. God calls us to live on mission for his kingdom while resting in all his promises and resting in his lordship over even this time of waiting. Right? Fear and panic, despair, hopelessness, these are all words that do not define believers. They're not characteristic of the person who is resting in the waiting. So rest. This rest that, that Christ calls us to, it's not a laziness right? It's not a sit back and just wait and watch things unfold. Christ still calls us to be on mission and to work hard and, and do everything that he calls us to, okay? As a church, as individuals, all those things are still true. But as we do those things, our hearts will be at rest. And so Christian, rest today in the glorious future that awaits you when Jesus returns. Rest in the waiting. Those who are ready and watchful for the return of Christ, they know him and they honor him. Those who are ready and watchful for the return of Christ are known by him. And those who are ready and watchful for the return of Christ can rest in the time of waiting. So are you ready? Are you watchful? I pray that today, we would live today in light of that day while realizing that today could be the day. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have not left us as orphans. We thank you that you promise that for all who know and love you, you have a glorious future. And Lord, we pray that you would find us faithful, that we would not put our hope in religiosity, that we would not be found complacent in false senses of security and self-righteousness but that we would throw ourselves upon your mercy. I pray for each one here that does not know you, that today they would see you for who you are, Jesus, and that you would call them by name. Help them to see that you long for them to be with you forever. 
and help them respond, we pray. God, we give you ourselves. We give you our today. And we ask that you would cause us to live as though eternity was real. We pray these things in your name. Amen. I'm so glad you're able to join us today in worship. If you have a need, a prayer request, feel free to reach out to us at the church here. You can give us a call or you can also email us. God bless you.